Good morning from Fresh Start. What a blessing it is to be back in the house of the Lord. Uh, good to be here. And uh, we're thankful for another opportunity to be in the house of God this morning. We're here in our Jonah Bible study. Uh, we're going to be finishing up the book of Jonah this morning. And uh, so if you would, grab your Bibles this morning for this family Bible study. And uh, while you're turning, uh, we'll ask Father for his blessings. Precious Father, we come to you thanking you for another blessed day. We ask Father that you would... Let this word land on fertile ground this morning. Open eyes and open ears to your word. And Father, we'll give you the praise and give you the glory for all things. In the precious name of Christ, I pray. Amen. Last study, we ended in chapter 2. And uh, I want to highlight just a little bit here. Uh, in chapter 2, in verse 8, it says, uh, They that observe lying vanities uh, forsake their own mercy. And uh, we, we understand that, that uh, when somebody takes and listens to something other than the Word of God to nourish them, it becomes lying vanities in their life. In other words, it has no strength. The Word of God has strength. The Word of God has strength today, and it carries you and I in a place that we are comforted uh, by the comforter. And I say that because the uh, majority of your people that say they love the Lord, we'll, we'll use the word Christians this morning, they love a feel-good message. And uh, a feel-good message is fine. There's nothing wrong with feeling good. Uh, but it's kind of like a sugar high, and it only lasts for just a little while. Myself, I would rather belly up to the table and be fed by the master than uh, of vanity and, and lying vanities. And, uh, but uh, we understand that when Scripture is brought out, that we are to have eyes to see and ears to hear and understand uh, what it is that Father is trying to say. Verse number 9, he said, But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. This is Jonah speaking. He said, At this time now I will give thanksgiving unto the Father. And he said, I will pay that that I have vowed. I guess a question would be asked this morning. Have you paid that vow unto the Lord that you said you would do? You know, many today, they raise their hand and say, you know, I want to do and I want to go. But when the going gets a little rough, if they aren't careful, as one pastor has said, that uh, they're kind of like hothouse lilies. Uh, they come up, and uh, when the sun comes up, they die out. It's important that we have strength in this day. Friends, we're living in the latter days. And there is so much discomfort in the flesh this day and time, spiritually and physically, that we need Christ more today than we ever have. We need the Father to give us the comfort that we need. And the only way that we can ever do that is to do what we said we were going to do. I really don't understand why I've went on to this position in this scripture here, but I do know that there are many today that assume that nobody's watching and they assume that nobody is paying attention. Therefore, they'll just kindly slide off from doing what they said they would for the Lord. I want to be sure and let the students know that Father he never forgets. He's got a wonderful memory. Not only is his memory good, but everything that is said is recorded. Therefore, Father can go back and see five years, 10, 15, 30 years down the line before when one had stood up and said, I would do this for God. I would go for God. I would give my all but yet they have slacked. Now, that's a human way. We're all capable of slacking and uh, capable of uh, coming short of God's glory. 
but it's so important, especially in this day that we're living in, that folks understand how important the Word of God is, how important that the Scriptures uh, uh, protect you and I and help us. They prepare us for that which is to come. He said here in the last verse of chapter 2, he said, And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon dry land. And therefore we know that uh, in this scripture is where we had spoke about uh, the, the god Dagon and uh, how that uh, this uh, supposedly a god, uh, that there of the Assyrians, they looked upon this fish, and Father brought this out for a reason, they looked upon this fish as being their god. And it brought out a prophet. And uh, as we get into chapter 3 here, you're going to see uh, what, uh, what God's plan truly was. So chapter 3 and verse 1, and it reads, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Now this is the second time that Father has spoken unto Jonah and tried to get his attention. Verse 2, Arise and go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it uh, the preaching that I bid thee. I want you, if you lighten up and you highlight this morning, you underline, you might want to underline that right there. He said, that I bid thee. For a teacher or a minister of the word of God, you must go by what Father has said. In the book of Ezekiel, chapter 13, verse number 1, now this is the opposite of what is said here. He said, uh, um, the great city and preach unto it, uh, the preaching that I bid thee. In chapter 13 in the book of Ezekiel, verse 1, and it reads, and the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel that prophesy, and say thou unto them that prophesy out of their own hearts. Hear ye the word of the Lord. It's so important this morning that we stay away from our own thoughts, that we stay away from our own ideas and our own confusion of the world. We've all got confusion. We've all got something in our life that can take your mind away. But what I'm trying to get to this morning is, is that we ought to listen to what God has to say. Verse 3, he said, Thus saith the Lord God, Woe unto the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. Many today love to exhort themselves and uh, get on a topic that they've heard through uh, maybe conversation or uh, through gossip, per se, and, and they try to highlight on that. And that's not of God. You see, this, this book is not a club. It's not meant to beat people over the head with. The Word of God is meant for people to be taught with and to be prepared. To prepare somebody, they first must have faith. And then once their faith is there, it must grow. You see, salvation is first. That's the milk of the Word. Then once we gain the milk, once we understand that salvation is for you and I, and we have received it, then we must move on. What if I make a mistake, Brother Randall? Must I be saved again? God forbid. We do not need to be saved again. The great apostle Paul, he said, should we uh, crucify the Lord afresh? Should we crucify the Lord again and again and again because we made a mistake? God forbid. It wasn't. Christ that made the mistake. It was you and I. Therefore, there needs to be a repentance, a repentive heart, where one goes to Christ and says directly what they have done. I have made a mistake. I have done these things, and I recognize it, Father. Forgive me in Jesus' name. You must pray in Jesus' name. Why is that? Because it gives the credentials uh, of what Christ done on the cross for you and I. When we end our prayer in Jesus' name, Father acknowledges and he sees it. Therefore, that what was binding you uh, is wiped clean from your slate, no longer to be against you. Verse 4, 
O Israel, the prophets are like foxes in the deserts. Now, if, uh, if you've ever read the Song of Solomon, you'll read there in chapter 2 and verse 15, talking about the little foxes. And uh, it's talking about how that they'll go up and uh, they'll nudge up underneath the vines and the blooms. And what they'll do, they'll knock the blooms off and it'll keep people from uh, growing. In other words, uh, like the grapes, it'll keep the grapes from glowing because of the bloom is gone. The same concept is that of a false prophet. If a false prophet gets inside the house of God and begins to stir up things, it can really cause a bad situation. That's why a good man of God, a good shepherd of God, he watches what comes through the doors. And he knows exactly, he or she knows exactly what the intent of that person may be. Uh, we don't want any harm brought into God's children. God's children are precious, and they're very tender, and some are more tender than others. Uh, some are a lot thicker skinned than others, and they can discern from their own. But some are very tender, and they're learning right today. Verse 5, Yet <clears throat> ye have not gone up into the gaps, neither made up the hedge uh, for the house of Israel. This hedge, you know what the hedge is? Uh, it's a hedge of protection. Have the secular been teaching that we are to um, watch for this first Christ to come? Has the secular church been teaching uh, that there is a false Christ coming first? This is this protection that we're speaking of this morning. It's so important that an individual knows that they're going to encounter a counterfeit. They are going to encounter someone that is going to come and proclaim to be Christ. And not only through his words is he going to proclaim these, this proclamation is going to be done through the works that he does. He's going to be able to snap his fingers and call down fire from heaven. And he's going to be able to heal uh, the sick. He's going to be able to give uh, to all of the world. And therefore, the world is going to believe that he is Christ. But the election know better. They know that he comes first. So he says, uh, <clears throat> You have not gone up into the gaps, neither made up the hedge for the house of Israel, to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. It's a battle that we are going to be standing in. How many of the secular churches are teaching that today? How many are teaching that there is going to be a battle in the life of these individuals that's going to live on this earth during the tribulation? Very few. Reason B, because majority of them believe that they're not going to be here during the tribulation. They believe in a rapture theory. You get on down into this chapter 13, uh, about verse 18 on down to 23, you see exactly what Father is talking about. He's talking about a flyaway doctrine, and he's against that. Verse 6, they have seen vanity and lying divination, saith the Lord. The Lord saith, and the Lord hath not seen them. And they have made others to hope that they would confirm their word. You see how that works? You get somebody to speak in tongues for just a moment, and uh, then you, you, uh, you hope that somebody is going to confirm that word, and therefore it makes it a religion. It's nothing more than confusion, my friends. Nothing more than babble in this day. We do not need, nor do we have time, for confusion. We are running on a clock, and this clock, the hourglass, is running down lower and lower every day. We've said that five years ago. It means more today than it did five years ago. Therefore, we know that time is running short. Verse 7, Have you not seen a vain vision? And have you not spoken a lying divination, whereas you say, The Lord saith, albeit I have not spoken. God's not spoken to these men or women that proclaim this uh, false doctrine. Verse 8, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, because ye have spoken vanity and seen lies, therefore behold, I am against you, saith the Lord God. I'm against you playing church. This is what Father is trying to say. I am against those who um, think that they can just go out and do what they want to do. When one raises their hand and they come into the family of God, friend, 
There's a work that needs to be done. And it's not a time for games. It's not a time for popularity. It's not a time for uh, anything other than teaching God's word properly. And that's what he's asked. Back in Jonah chapter 3, in verse number 3. So Jonah arose and went into Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city uh, of three days' journey. And uh, this whole city, it would take you three days to travel all the way around this city. That's how large it was. Verse 4, And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. And he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That's all he said. That's all that Jonah preached. Therefore, that's what is given to you and I. But he didn't say, if you repent, he didn't say that if you would to change your evil ways. All he said, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. 40 meaning probation. You see, Jonah had an alt against this city. He had an alt against these people, the Assyrians. You see, uh, we know that it was the Assyrian that brought us into captivity. Us being our people, they were the ones who separated uh, our people. And Jonah didn't want to go and bring salvation uh, unto these people. Why? Well, they were his enemy. But that don't make it right, friend. Verse 5, So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. This proclaiming a fast is something that's done in a time of repentance. When one truly repents, you fast from the things that your flesh yearns for. You fast from these things. You take and you cut it out. You cut out all the things in your life. And what that does, that shows God that you are giving great attention. Now, if one were to fast and give uh, time, you during this fasting, there's going to be times when your subconscious is going to want you to go back to that thing. Go back to that thing that you desire mostly. And that's the desire of the flesh. And we are to, uh, well... Work against that during our time of fasting. And he said, and then put on sackcloth. And what's the sackcloth mean? Well, the sackcloth shows that uh, they are degrading themselves. I don't care how much money you've got or what position you hold. When putting on this sackcloth, it puts you in the same category as everyone. And it humbles you. It humbles you to a place where God can use you. The only time that you can ever be used by God is when you are humbled and you are clean. You see, Father, he can look on the heart. He knows uh, way before we even say what we say. You see, Father is what we'll call a cardio knower. He knows the heart. He knows what is going to be brought up, be it a deception or be it a blessing. Father knows. So verse 6, or excuse me, let me, uh, let me, let me read something here. Uh, first, or excuse me, uh, Second Chronicles. In Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles 7 and verse 13. He said here in Second Chronicles 7 and 13, he said, I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, verse 14, he said, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. 
said, well, Brother Randall, that's, that's all the way back over there in Second Chronicles. Does that apply to us today? <laughs> you better know it. Amen. It's what God's asked you to do. That's what God has said. And you see, these people of Nineveh, they listened. You see, God spoke to them. He spoke to them in that still, small voice. He didn't have to come with a, a mighty wind and a, a tornado and an earthquake to get the attention of the people. Father spoke in a small, still voice. And he got the attention of these people. Verse 6. For word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him and covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. You see, even the king came off of the throne. He had enough concern about his people to give an example and show them that they needed to get right with God. You see, in that day, this Nineveh was, was just as bad as Sodom. And there was going to be a destruction brought upon these people because of the lifestyle that they led. And this king knew it. You see, the, uh, the sackcloth, it shows re a repentive heart. And that's exactly what God wants. He wants you to repent. That's what John, the Baptist, came. He came and proclaimed, repent, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. If there's anything you get out of this message this morning, it would be that you stay in a repentive situation all your life. Just as repentive as you possibly can. You say, now, Brother Randall, are we to be cowed down all of our life? No, that's not what God said. He said, I want you to be accountable for your actions. I want you to be accountable for what you say. Therefore, if we make that mistake, we must go to the Father through repentance. And he sat in ashes. It's like desolation and ruin, more or less, to show that he is mourning and that he is showing a point of repentance. Verse number 7. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. Verse 8, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Cry mightily unto Yahweh. Yea, let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence uh, that is in their hand. If we could only get America to repent this morning. If we could have a revival of nothing more than repentance, I believe we could knock on the doors of heaven and get God's attention. But prophecy has already been laid out before you and I. We know that's not going to happen. We know that God is not going to hear from all of the world or all of the United States because there's many here that do not believe and there's many here that do not understand. Verse 9. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger uh, that we perish not? Question. They didn't know, but they thought they would give it a try. You see, these people worship Dagon, but yet they are giving honor unto the true and living God. Why? Because this prophet that was brought out onto the land out of the fish that got their attention, he preached to them. He said, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. They took heed to that. I just wonder how many people take heed to the word of God this morning. How many people realize that time is running out and the Antichrist is soon to come? Verse 10. And I saw their works. Verse 10, it says, And God saw their faith by their works. 
that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. You see, God is capable of repenting from the evil that he said he would do, meaning that uh, allowing these people to perish. God gave them an extra chance, another chance, just like many of us today. I can remember when Father spoke to my heart. You know, I felt like it was going to be the very last day of my life. If I didn't change my life and if I didn't change my situation, something drastic was going to happen in my life. Father got this boy's attention. I pray that he's got your attention this morning. Chapter number four in verse number one, and it reads, But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. Why was Jonah so angry? Because he wanted to see the destruction of Assyria. He wanted to see the destruction of Nineveh so that these people wouldn't be able to take our people into captivity. You see, Jonah knew. Verse 2, And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying? Jonah's getting a little tesky here. He said, When I was yet in my country, question, therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and a merciful God and slow to anger and of great kindness and repentest thee of the evil. In other words, he said, uh, I kind of figured this is what was going to happen. I kind of figured that God was going to take it easy on these. You see, there's nothing easy about repentance. There's nothing easy about owning up to the wrong that one has done. That's the fault of many people today. Many people won't own up to the fault that they have done in this life. Therefore, things come about. Problems come about. Situations come about because they will not repent unto the Lord. Verse 3. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me. For it is better for me to die than to live. Now, why would Jonah say that? Well, mostly because Jonah's going to have to go back to his people, isn't he? He's going to have to go back to where he came from. And the Hebrews are going to know that he went and preached to the enemy. And that the enemy uh, was secure with God. Verse 4, Then said the Lord, Doest thou well to be angry? It do you well to be angry, Jonah. We read last week in Isaiah 55. And I'm going to pick it back up there again just this real quick. In Isaiah chapter 55 and verse number 8. Father said, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. Regardless how strong or how long you've been into this thing, if you are not following the direction of God, if you're not doing what God asks, then you're going against him. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Ten... For as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth a bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. That's God's plan. That's God's plan that we all be fed, that we come out of Babylon, and that we understand the truth. Verse 11 is why I came. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. You see, these people from Nineveh, they heard from the Lord. It shall not return into me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please. And it shall prosper in the thing whereinto I sent it. So now you see that it doeth Jonah well to be angry. 
You can be angry all you want, Jonah. But these people are mine, God said. These are God's children. Every human being on this planet is God's children. You say, well, now, uh, even the, the evil or uh, those that don't believe, all of the children, all of the people are God's children. He created every one of them. You see, it does God no good uh, uh, to uh, curse his children. God doesn't want that. God doesn't want to punish his children. He said, I would that all come to repentance. Verse 5. So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city, and there made him a booth and sat under it in the shadow till he might see what would become of the city. He's going to sit back and he's going to try to figure out what's going to happen you see there there was needing to be 40 days that should pass and he wanted to see what was going to happen now we know symbolically that Christ went through the wilderness for 40 days and then after that he was tempted but Jonah took and made himself a booth he took some branches and, and covered himself and sat underneath it. Verse 6, And the Lord God prepared a gourd and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceedingly glad of the gourd. Let me throw something in here for you this morning. I want you to think of this gourd. This is a spiritual thought. I want you to think of this gourd as a flyaway doctrine, as a false hope. You see, it says, And the Lord God prepared a gourd and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shadow. And that's all that the flyaway doctrine is, is a shadow. There's no such thing as being called away early or a, a rapture. There's no such thing as a rapture theory, although men like to think there are. But that word rapture is not even in God's word. But Father is far more wiser than you and I. He brought it out in Ezekiel 13, chapter 13, verse 18 down to 23. And he said, I'm against those who give my people hope to fly where there is no hope. Friends, it's a lie. And that's what he's saying here. He said, uh, and that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. And that's what a lot of people do. They attach themselves to this doctrine to, well, deliver them from their own thoughts, from their own grief, thinking that, well, if I attach myself and I live good and I love Jesus, uh, uh, that he'll come and he'll rapture me away. That's the furthest thing from the truth. That's not God's plan at all. God's plan is for you to do what? To go through the tribulation. To go through it and be safe on the other side. To utilize all of the instruments that God has laid out for you and I. To utilize all of the instructions and to know that these things are coming. That's what prepares you and I through this tribulation period. That's how we will overcome during the tribulation period. We will be overcomers because we foreknow. We already have an understanding. So Jonah was exceedingly glad of the gourd. Now that's not what this scripture is saying, okay? But I am adding this in a little bit for you to get a better understanding of what God's plan is. Verse 7, But God prepared a worm when the morning rose the next day, and it smote the gourd uh, that it withered. <laughs> His hope was gone. You see, there's going to be people that's going to wake up. They're going to come to the light and understand that, you know, this rapture is not true. This rapture is a lie. And they're going to know that they've been fooled. The worm, you know who the worm is? 
I don't have to really lay that out, but I'll throw it out there for you. That's none other than Satan, Lucifer. Verse 8, and it came to pass when the sun did arise uh, that God prepared a vehement east wind. And the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted and wished in himself to die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. This vehement east wind, it means it is a very hot wind that come. But those students that understand the word of God, you know what the east wind is. It's the ruash. It's the Holy Spirit of God. And he said he prepared this east wind. And the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted and wished to himself to die. You see? In that day, at the last trump, when Christ appears, many people are going to pray uh, that they could die. But the problem with it is, is that they cannot die. Therefore, their flesh has already been changed. 1 Corinthians 15 and 52. They've all been changed. They're in their spiritual bodies. And they are now in condemnation with God. And they know that they have wronged. They have studied wrong. They went to church all these years of their life and never understood uh, the plan of God. It finally come to their understanding that they were wronged. That's why he said, and he wished unto himself to die. And he said, it'd be better for me to die than to live. Many people will feel that way. They don't have to. There's still time today. Time to do what, Brother Randall? To repent. To repent in Jesus' name. Come to the knowledge of the truth. Come to the understanding. Verse number 9. And God said to Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? Question. And he said, I do well to be angry even unto death. This is Jonah's reply. Verse 10. Then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the gourd, for that which thou hast not labored, neither madest it grow, catch this now, which came up in a night and perished in a night. It came up as quick as it went back. Amen? And that's exactly what God wants his children to do this morning, to stomp out this lie of the rapture. He said there again in the very part, latter part of that, he said, which came up in a night and perished in the night. The night is for the children of disobedience. You see, a child of disobedience does things in the dark. They sliver around and they hide in the darkness so a man cannot see them. That's what's done in the dark. We, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, let me read that for you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse number 5. Let's read 4. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, uh, that the day should overtake you as a thief. It shouldn't overtake you as a thief. And I pray that we have done our part to educate those who are listening that we are to wait upon the Lord. We are not to go after the first one that comes on the scene. We are to wait upon God. The key to it all is you will never see Jesus, the Messiah, while you are still in the flesh. Verse 5, Ye are all the children of light. And the children of the day, we are not of the night nor of darkness. So we see here that what God has proclaimed to Jonah is that he put his faith in this gourd. He put his faith in something that he had no labor in. And he had no concern, didn't know how it came up, but it went within a day. Verse 11, to come to a close. 
This is God speaking. And he said, And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle question? I guess I'll ask you the question. Was it right for God to send salvation unto these people? Well, we know that Christ died, John chapter 3 and verse 16, that God so loved Israel. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. His desire was that these, his children, would come to the knowledge of the truth. Matthew chapter 20. I want to read something to you this morning before we come to a close. Matthew chapter 20. And verse number 8. This is speaking of Christ when he came to the vineyard and was going to hire people to work in his vineyard. And we'll start reading about verse number 8. So when even was come, the Lord of the vineyard saith unto the steward, Call the laborers and give them their hire from the beginning from the last unto the first. Nine. And when they came, they were hired about the eleventh hour. They received every man a penny. Ten. But when the first came, uh, they supposed that they should have received more. And they likewise received every man a penny. And when they had received it, they murmured against the good man of the house, saying, These last have wrought but one hour. And thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden of the heat all the day. I guess the question would be asked, are you against those that came to salvation in this latter day? Although you've been in service for the Lord for a long time, been studying along the lines the way you should for many years, but yet there's people that's coming in today, coming to know the knowledge of the truth. What a blessing it is. You see, he said here in verse number 11, And when they had received it, they murmured against the good man of the house, saying, Lest have we wrought one hour that he have made them equal unto us? They are equal. Verse 13, But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst not thou agree with me for a penny question? Take that thine is and go thy way. I will give unto thee last even unto thee. 15. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will do with mine own? Is thine eye evil because I am good? That's where we need to watch. We need to know that God is a God of love. And he has a desire that all would come to repentance. That they would all shun the evil and come to the knowledge of the truth. 16. So the last shall be first and the first last. Many shall be called, but few are chosen. What we get from the book of Jonah is that our God is a just God. There's no reason for you and I to question there's no reason for you and I to cry or whine when things come our way. The majority of the time, people will forget where they have messed up or forget to repent or forget to clean their slate, for one would say. And friends, it's so important that on an everyday basis that we come in a, a repentant heart before Christ 
so that our slate is clean, so that we are ready and prepared to meet the Lord at any moment in time. But the book of Jonah, there is so much given in the word of God here in the book of Jonah, and it's so sad that your secular today likes to take the book of Jonah as some child's play and uh, use it as a, a fish and things of this nature. It's just sad to know that many lose the thought and the understanding from the truth of God's word. God, even through this story, is trying his best to reach the people today, to let them know that there is a need of repentance and that we are to extend our hand to all and do what we can to encourage all to repent. Did God say, open up your pockets and let them just all come into your home and just take whatever? They... No, that's not what he said. God wants you to direct these people and give them understanding, give them knowledge, and give them a, 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 de a desire to turn their heart over to God. We appreciate you this morning. Thank you again for being with us in our Jonah study. We, uh, we finished here in the book of Jonah, and uh, this uh, next Sunday will be uh, our Christmas, and uh, we will be doing it from our home. And uh, we appreciate you again for studying with us. We pray something's been said this morning to encourage you or to help you. And uh, if nothing else to be said, we, uh, we, we truly appreciate you. Thank you again for uh, tuning in with us. And uh, thank you for your cards and your letters. Uh, we've gotten so many of the cards and uh, the letters. And uh, the response from the people is just wonderful. And we thank you again for that. Uh, pray for us. And we'll pray for you. Until the next time, may the Lord richly bless. All right. <laughs>